So, uh, Simon, regarding a lot of this uh, talk about rationalism and then vitalism <laughs> kind of going against it and just like all these things going on right now, as somebody who is part of uh, the academia industrial complex or whatever it is that you want to call, uh, what has been your view looking at uh, things going on in the more underground online circle? I mean, look, it's not the fucking dark web, but you know what I mean. Just like people who are, you know, speaking truth to power in their own way on the internet some have been uh purged recently because that whole twitter thing i don't want to get into it right now but you know we, we all know what we're talking mm -hmm. uh, talking about here but uh this in general, also what... goes to information like what we were saying before about yeah of uh cognition itself being under threat by certain forces of not just censorship but also the curation of uh you meant like with Bayesian reasoning, I mean, this is the basic fundamental of like AI programming as well, or machine learning. So what happens when basically everything that you're seeing online and elsewhere, everything you shop for is being filtered through uh, algorithms that project certain outcomes or rather guide you towards certain outcomes. What does that mean also for the nature of, of thought itself and how we, we live in a society yeah. um, and how and how certain one, people like the bronze age uh, uh pervert fans are being led by uh caribbean algorithms <laughs> <laughs> it means that when you live long in the society society also lives in you well, well there you go that's a good that's a good place to begin yeah um no it's i it's it's very interesting to watch the you know yukowski um Bay Area rationalism, right? You sort of take over a chunk of whatever nerd space. Um, it's you know from the you know you know greetings from the cathedral, right? Speaking from the cathedral, it's uh, it's it's you know it's an interesting heresy, right? It's like you take one book, um, you know, out of probably the Old Testament, and you you read it and reread it obsessively, and so that it just watching. Um, you know, people actually form self-help groups, you know, like this is the new version of ASP, yeah. right? San Francisco is, you know, I, I remember, you know, when I first started working on these groups, I, I talked to a friend of mine and um, I said, you know, look, after, you know, two years of work, I I've discovered there are cults in California. <laughs> and, you know, after another year, I was like, I've just, they use LSD to control people, right? Oh, so, um, you know, this is, this is how, how long it takes academia to catch up. We need, yes, um, we need the right wing Eastland Institute right now. So, <laughs> there you go. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, the other thing is, I mean, this is, I think it's, I think it's best to think of Yukowski and, um, and I don't mean to speak against him personally or to him personally, just this representation. Um, you know, I think it's, I think Foucault is the right, perhaps the right lens here, right? This is a discourse. It's a discourse that doesn't really locate itself in any particular person. Mm -hmm. um, and it's primarily, I would say, disciplinary regime, right? So what I, what I noticed, and I'm going to speak informally, right? What I noticed is that people use this to structure their lives um, in a regulatory way, right? To set boundaries on, you know, what they can think and how they think and where they think. So it's like these straight back chairs. And so people are sitting in straight back chairs and they, oh, this is going to make, you know, this is going to improve my posture, mm -hmm. right? Um, the other thing I noticed, and again, this is just informally, right? When I, when I would go visit these, these um, you know, places um, and uh, you know, many, how do I put this, many wonderful people in these places, many great gentlemen and ladies in these places, um, you know, years. there was this question, there was this question, like, what are we improving our posture for, right? We're going to think more rationally, but what's the win? And so this was something that, you know, people really struggled with, um, you know, Yudkowsky, God bless this guy, right? It's like, oh, the win is saving humankind from this like imagined apocalypse that I've just right. generated, right? <laughs> and that's great, right? So, you know, that's super altruistic. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, certifiable, but at least, you know, this is a person <laughs> with a good soul, you know, stranded in minus Mario world, like minus world. Um, I think I noticed was like a huge interest in, you um, uh, this whole pickup artist scene. This was really weird, right? So I like mm. show up and I, I know I've got my, you know, East Coast, uh, you know, sports code, right? And someone's like, oh, you're peacocking. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting in this like most <laughs> rational space of all time. Oh. And, and I'm like, wait a second, like this, I, I've done research on this, but you know, this is weird, right? Who knew? Um, so that was part of it. Um, you know, power, seasteading, the Peter Thiel universe. Um, but there was this missing, there was this gap, right? Um, and the gap is in part, uh, you know, okay, Bayesian reasoning, what is it? Like, Lev, you asked this question, right? 
that it's a story about how to compose your beliefs together so that you never contradict yourself. First of all, that's a good question. Is that a, is that a reasonable goal in life, right? I'm not sure. Um, is is self consistency a reasonable goal? You might think of this as the most horrifying thing to be held to your to your to your prior states of mind. Um, but one of the things that's also missing. It's like this is what you believe, but then there's this other question in folk psychology, like what do you want, right? So yeah. This is I, this is this big yeah. gap, and I think you know you talk about people going bananas on the Object internet. Petit that, yeah, it's like they, what, right, okay, the object, yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. What is what is that thing? Um, I mean, okay, Joe, you know, I think this is. Lacan, right? I, 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 this is way, you know, above my pay grade. But um, <laughs> oh, don't you know, worry. If, Most Lacanians have never read Lacan, so it's it's. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's good. They're, that's uh, <laughs> oh, they're like Marxists. <laughs> they're, oh, <there> you go. <laughs> I, yeah, right. Have you have you read Volume Eight of the of Das Kapital? Uh, but yeah, so I think that's you know that maybe what's driving people mad on the internet is not uh, the problem of reason, but the problem of desire. I think. Oh, and that's yeah. that's that's what I saw. I mean, look, there yeah. was this discipline of um of thought uh, and i mean i'll just say some wonderful stories so there's really good people but i remember the first time i was out there we went to a chinese restaurant and there's like 30 people and they're you know kind of grad student vibe and i'm sitting there and i'm like i'm gonna get stuck with this check i know it i'm gonna get stuck with the check and uh then at the end everyone's like all right we're gonna pull out and they like you know you pull out your quantum random number generator and they pick someone at random to pay the bill and you know in expectation value you split the bill so these sort of these wonderful moments in which they transpose a chunk of you know, whatever 1970s statistics into lived experience, that's fine. Um, but then this next stage, which is, okay, now supposedly Yudkowsky has given you superpowers equivalent to a real world Harry Potter. So wh what are you gonna wish for? And that's, that's when things, that's when the neo rats and the post rats and the NRX crew, that's when things get psychoanalytically very revealing maybe geo i'd say that oh yes very so well even when you start trying to learn how to want <laughs> and sometimes when you want something that bad then you'll start crafting a whole world of wealth and shang around that desire itself uh, well no, one, one of my favorite passages is um it's a rare condition this day and age to read any mm -hmm. good news on a newspaper page love and tradition of the grand design some people say it's even harder to find what what lyric or where is that from? That's from the uh, for those who don't know, that's from the Family Matters theme song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Well, it's true. I mean, but it's actually that's interesting. Philadelphia that both, born and bred. Yeah. That, that both on, Full sorry. House, Full House, and Family Matters, they both had very similar theme songs. Not only in the way that they were composed, but even in the lyrics. Uh, let's see the lyrics for uh, Full House. Everywhere you look, uh, it was. Um, Whatever happened to predictability, the milkman, the paper boy, the evening TV, how did I get to living here? Somebody tell me, please, this old world's confusing me. So there we go. Like, it's a very well, that, that was the last of gasp of the, uh, the wholesome American uh, sitcom or family sitcom until <laughs> the Simpsons murdered them back when the Simpsons were edgy. Uh, and it was almost like you could see that fatalism of like, oh, what happened? Uh, but no, it's it's fun. it's interesting you mentioned, um, uh, Professor, uh, you must have done your research because I am a pretty hardcore Foucauldian. And so this connection, uh -oh. I... <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, is that a come on no go on, go on. Thank you. So, sorry. well i like to consider myself a right foucauldian a right but it's go, it go is on. it is true i i feel like a lot of this discourse is based around or predicated on um this the, the disciplinary aspect of this internalized servitude towards one's own capacity for reason and one's own tools mm. of reason but also mm. what comes up is what you were describing is essentially the image of thought, right? Like this, this is very much Deleuzian, right? Like in the size of control, the image of thought is something that pred is predicated on the assumptions you make about thinking itself, about the way you approach certain questions. And I feel that the rationalists or the neo rats, or, oh, whatever the fuck, I, I think with the exception of Negristani, they really don't think about the ways in which thinking itself is conditioned by certain meta assumptions of thinking itself and i know this sounds very mm -hmm. like nerdy and i don't know very like theory cell but it that's just to me it just opens up like you know so much i mean 
uh, chaos and hopeful abandon you two can talk about this and hopefully you can talk about the experience in, in academia as well from the other perspective right so yeah. yeah i can say that with what you're saying they do try um and one of the one of the things that's difficult in talking about like you know the rats versus the post rat post rats is that like anything you know anything you might be tempted to say like oh you know rats do this whereas post rats do that and like you know post rats like you know think think about like you know like deep emotive processes and and like you know regard things in terms of of like you know broad constructions of of you know cognition and cybernetics and and, and so on um and like you know think about gods and demons and and whatnot like any of that you can find rats who are doing it um like you know like it's you know there, there there's there's a lot going on in the in the rat sphere um and a lot of that leads leads to, to them like basically like descending into shit posting mode which is is you know that's really how you become a post rat is like you you basically stop making you know like trying really hard posts on less wrong and you just kind of you know start like you know fucking around on twitter um <clears throat> but like you know there's there's a lot of a, attempts to to examine uh, the you know the the preconditions of thought the you know the the limitations of the the tools that they're using to think and uh, you, know, mm -hmm. um, you know language itself and so on um, it just I don't know it, it it never seemed to to go far enough uh, to me but like you know there's there's effort there oh yeah I, you know I, I guess I wanted to stick up for him a little bit. What is their end I think game? It's, I mean, it's That's... yeah. <laughs> go go on, uh, Simon, um, then Gio. Yes, thank you, thank you, Love. I mean, I, I, Gio, I think that's a great question, right? What is the end game? Um, and have you know, has anyone thought that? Um, I mean, two thoughts. And one thing, I mean, is is and this is when whenever we study, uh, and I need a good name for this. Actually, a colleague of mine, Chloe Perry, and I talked about um, uh, counter epistemic communities is a good term, mm -hmm. right? So these are groups oh. who's, um, you know, like you have a countercultural group and this is like, okay, we're going to rear, you know, dog collars. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, we're going to break certain norms of behavior, the counter epistemic groups, like we're going to break certain norms of reasoning, right? We're going to, we're going to smash in one direction or another, the, the prevailing mode. And so the rationalists do this NRX does this really, obviously, I mean, Yarvin is a, is a kind of classic example. Uh, but so when we study these groups, you know, 98% of them, I'm looking at my graphs on, on the, on this, on the pin to my wall here. Uh, and it's like, exactly as KL says, right. Uh, it's, you know, it's a self-similar graph. What that means is you get these kind of mega creatures who are dominating the space, like Bukowski, um, you know, red pill is one of the groups we study. Um, but the other thing it means is like 99% of these people show up you know, they're like that uh, weird, um, you know, thing that Avi Loeb's obsessed by, right? Like, like they just pass through this space for, you know, a day, a week, a month, and then they're gone, right? So, you know, when we, when we think about these groups, we also said, I mean, one of the kind of crucial things is, what does it do to somebody who's there for like 10 minutes, right? Most people are tourists, right? And in fact, the, the overwhelming majority of tourists. So that's a, that's a really, that's a kind of piece of the puzzle there. Um, you know, the, the other thing I just, I just love about this remark that, that you make us is, you know, this is people with an image of thinking, right? And that, I mean, this goes all the way back to Hegel, right? Trying to talk about a, the object of thought itself. Uh, what you get immediately is, of course, this kind of stacked infinitude of, you know, let's represent representation to ourselves and represent the representation of representation to yeah. ourselves and so on. <laughs> so there's there's something so odd about where you get all the you, way yeah. back to the master and slave. Yeah. Well, exactly right. What is the you know where's the where's the asymptote? Um, what's funny is if you if you look at some of the stuff that that and again Yukowski just to take him as a sort of ca character um, when you when you go back and look at him, um, there's none of that reflexive thought. Uh, at least at the beginning. And it's mostly, what it reminds me the most of is like Scientific American, right? It's like science, this is great. <laughs> like, I'm going to blow your mind with this, you know, one weird yeah. trick. So, Gio, but please go I mean, on. I mean, you, many, many Then concepts. from there, shading kind of into like Reddit atheist sort of territory. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's some great yeah. stuff written about that. I, I won't, I won't play Joy, but Gio, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, I, that, that's great. That Because ha, ha, being someone who also has spent a lot of time studying well, being a part of as well, various like internet, like dissident internet ecologies, 
um it, it it's there's this weird sort of convergence with um like schizo culture on the internet and and breaking down and how sort of uh, i had this article once it was on the original um it was on the original uh what was it called autistic mercury website um and it was i i called it a uh, shark wombing where people that try to achieve mainstream clout they'll like sort of become they'll be within an internet ecology i think i called it um the the uh I had like some weird long drawn out name for it uh, that was like really pretentious and stupid. What was it called? Uh, digital savagery is how um, sort of an, uh, an online model of uh, hostile ecologies where on the internet where it's like people, they, you know how like sharks, tiger sharks are born, right? They basically fight each other in the open womb. Uh, it's like this water. Um, it's like a, 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 a sack filled womb filled with uh uh, embryonic f- fluid and they have to like fight each other to get out and whoever swims out that's the one that gets born right so I said that this is sort of a model I know it's it's totally death metal like it's like listening to 90s uh, cannibal corpse um, so I said that that is similar to like a lot of these online spaces where in the pursuit of achieving some sort of like mainstream success or grift you have a lot of like interactions between people that is essentially boiled down to I'm going to stab as many backs as I can. So then I will achieve like transcendence. And of course I was talking about people on YouTube and so (laughs) forth. So what happens is there's a lot of repeatability between a lot of these uh, internet based interactions between like largely marginalized, um, very underground sort of groups. And I feel that uh, to me, it's like it's it's a really crazy sort of uh, observation of what happens when people are totally uninhibited by anonymity and other forces, mm-hmm. and and given sort of the older attitude of the internet being like this isn't a place where serious things happen, right? This is a place where people can sort of let their like libidinal economy just like totally enter like a, a deregulated bear market. So now it's like what happens when you take a bunch of people who are neuro atypical together and put them in the same space. And then they create these sort of these hierarchies predicated upon clout posting, um, internet drama, so forth. And that becomes the fuel I said for a lot of these interactions. But, but then that's the question of like, does this, is, is it just that in the information society, is this a unique occurrence or is this always been, but now we have like this accelerated version of like, this weird like you know taboo mores of social interaction between people like like a lot of the business like having spent some time in academia not like i got to the master's level put it that way but like it it seems like the weird byzantine regulations of behavior and thinking it's almost like not that i'm sympathetic to that but it's almost like uh, oh maybe maybe, uh, there's a point to it it's like uh Maybe it's a use for us. Hmm. Well, yeah, exactly. It's like the prison YouTuber, Wes Watson. Uh, he's like, you know, people talk about politics in the federal pen. If there wasn't politics, people would get stabbed left and right. <laughs> politics being like the, the clicks in the cars and so forth. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm definitely going to go with that. It. It's an acceleration of a, a pattern that's always existed. And, you know, probably largely what you would find uh, going back is that the, what what's happening in, you know, these, these, little pool subcultures before now was happening before in secret societies. Mm -hmm. Um, I I posted in the the zoom chat, uh, my tweet from 2018 on this topic, which was uh, subcultures are for growing monsters in ideally monsters so strong, they can punch holes in the superculture. (laughs) Oh, that's true. Well, it's real Samista right there, you know, it's a, it's pretty interesting that you're uh, pointing this out as I was going to, uh, read this from uh, Lovers of Sophia by Jason Reza Giorgiani. I don't know, Simon, are you familiar with Giorgiani's work? No, no, I'm afraid not. He's a very interesting guy. Like, it's hard for me to say where exactly I would categorize him in. I mean, I know he has kind of a um, uh, seedy reputation as far as certain people like uh, Richard Spencer that he was associated with back in the past. But as far as certain things that he ended up... uh, you know, writing down, you could say it's like super high level shizzo posting in a way, like when he talks about ancient civilizations and space aliens and all this kind of stuff. But it goes goes together in a very interesting way. So over here, he um, wrote about, uh, so what Nietzsche, qua apocal- apocalypt prophet, is seeing through a glass darkly here and what was adopted as a plan of action by 
Skorzeny and his comrades is something that I would conceptualize as a baudende Aufbruch ins Weltanschauungskrieg. Thank you. Heidegger was right that some things can only be thought in German. A bow is the term <laughs> deconstruction from Heidegger's thought, so that a bauende literally means unbuilding or dismantling, but through its connection with the destruction of the history of ontology, that was the projected aim of being in time, and in light of the socio politically dangerous implications of such dynamiting of the paradigmatic principles of a world epoch, I suggest that rendering a baudene as destructive, which carries within it the sense of deconstructing, uh, sorry, destructuring. The idea of Abbruch has a rich philosophical and literary history in modernist German thought. It is alternatively translated as breakup in the sense of a breaking with or divorce or breakthrough in the sense of a revolutionary discovery rather than an incremental increase in knowledge and finally as a breakaway in the sense that such discoveries can represent a rupture wherein something or someone heads out of bounds in a different direction. In other words, a breakout or departure. Thus, my concept for what Skorzeny, Kamler, Gechlin, Bormann, and company did indeed, even if it remained imprecisely conceptualized, could be loosely translated as destructive departure in worldview warfare. Although based on the alternative meaning of the terms, it is also possible to translate it as deconstructive breakthrough in psychological warfare or dismantling breakaway in the worldwide ideological war. This is the worldwide constitutive or emergent state of a breakaway civilization. It is based both on a breakthrough in the positive sense and on a negative breaking down and breaking away. This allows those who have broken through to come back and conquer what they have broken down in a way that is, uh, here comes this word, Kriegsentscheidend for the Weltanschauungskrieg. Recall that this term, uh, World view war, that... Yeah, worldview yes. warfare. Uh, so this term, Kriegsentscheidend, or war decisive, was a classification at the top, highest level, above top secret, uniquely given to Project Kronos. Okay, and I'm not going to get into Project Kronos <laughs> right now with the bell and all that, for those who yeah, know. I'm, I'm what... pretty sure Land wrote about the same thing there, but uh, characterizing it as outbreak in the sense of a rash. <laughs> interesting but like yeah, what exactly infection, what say. exactly can we make of this because long story short Giorgiani believes that the Nazis are still around that they're living in Antarctica somewhere like in the bases or maybe like in the inner earth and that they've uh, taken control of a lot of our institutions planning a breakaway civilization right now and how like all of us are kind of left behind on the prison planet so in a way they want to destroy civilization so that we don't get to the point where we're able to harness energy because we're about bunch of stupid well, motherfuckers that d wouldn't know what to do well, with I that power point out, i should point out that uh Giorgiani is a promethean cosmopolitan who uh <laughs> broke away from the alternative right uh when he saw that they had very like regressive thinking and so he essentially wants to embrace like a positive vision of like post-human transcendence that is like not of the like either of like the rakers while variety or like the landian horrorist type of stuff <laughs> so i don't know make of that what you will but i guess we are kind of like in an information war like for example i was reading this shout out to my boy lomez he wrote this brilliant article today uh for i am 1776 it's called intergener it's called generational war yeah and it's all about this sort of war over the distribution of information uh and i, I wonder if this sort of this arising of a lot of these like alternative underground spaces on the internet i wonder if that's probably and who knows if i'm just making too much of it right but if that's like a result of sort of a fundamental breakdown what people have called the semiotic collapse you know justin murphy always talks about the semiotic collapse now great what's it is the first so word in there that you the said semantic semi apocalypse according to baker sorry semantic politics yeah 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 semantic apocalypse yes um so I wonder if we should just ride the tiger on this or should if there is like something seriously wrong going on, like with well, this whole well the last thing that Georgiani said was basically there's such like, a thing as wrong 
Mm. Well, again, a- a- according to according to Jushani, once again, like he thinks that if human beings don't figure out a way to get our shit together, then we kind of deserve whatever it is that's going to happen to us as far as, you know, his theory of the breakaway civilization reducing right, so civilization. Fine. Well, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, will we be able to get our shit together in time? I mean, maybe small circles of us. Isn't it will. exciting I mean, to find out? It, it would be. I mean, this is kind of what I'm doing here with BTR, where I want to get circles of people together to rise those circles up at least. I don't know about the rest of humanity, but I'm just talking about if people in small circles can get their shit together, then that's already, I think, good, even from the perspective of reincarnation, right? Yeah, if reincarnation exists, that. then uh, people who are able to get certain knowledge and uh, exchange ideas with each other now they will be able to, in a certain way, pass it on to whatever form they're going to acquire in their next life, assuming reincarnation exists. So it's not a total loss if, if we look at it that way. I don't know. Mm. I also want to hear from uh, Ostov. Ostov, you've been awfully quiet, and I want to make sure that uh, you can get a word in uh, edgewise here as well. How are you, buddy? Yeah, sorry. I just didn't want to uh, bring down the level of conversation going on right now. I mean, Oh, not, a, not at all. No, that's my job. <laughs> okay, right, right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, well, maybe you could say that uh, if we assign a certain probability to reincarnation being true, then there's a certain utility and in information being passed on through that way. And so there might be some marginal gain that way, right? If you want to go back into rationalism again. <laughs> um, I assume certainly... they'll, they'll have a formula for calculating with each uh, reincarnation cycle. Like they'll have a probability of how closer you are to Muksha. That would be like one of the... <laughs> Absolutely. It'll be something like a Drake's equation where it's just seven <laughs> unknowns all multiplied together. Um, so I feel emotions and I have dreams and I'm not a rational being and I don't try to analyze myself through that lens. Like I'm not I'm not a big fan of like the Evo psych kind of, you know, finding biological impulses behind every higher brain pattern that goes on. I feel like there's a lot of things that get missed by that kind of a framing. And this is all a bunch of, mm-hmm. um, you know, this is obviously like something that's going to vary a lot from person to person. It's really hard to, I think, build like a convincing objective case about this kind of thing. But that's kind of the thing that's mostly kept me away from like pure rationalist um, trying to treat every kind of social problem or, you know, any kind of situation involving human beings as something when as something that you can uh, analyze and optimize and, you know, turn into a sequence of quantified variables, functions, and things like that. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just the struck by this. The worldview of, of rationalism doesn't work for you. Okay, wait, wait, what? <laughs> Sorry. Wait, the, okay, the so high, fine, go on, yeah. The high modernist utopian worldview of rationalism uh, doesn't work for you here. Yeah, actually, um, if we want to like drag in the other post word here, right? I think you can probably make a connection between post rationalism and post modernism, in that they're kind of a similar disillusionment with the, um, yeah, like the rationalist modernist um, kind of intellectual utopia project that came before them. Yep, I mean, post rats love seeing like a state. Uh, th- this is one of the you know the known things about them. I also <laughs> love seeing like a state. I think that's that the book has it's a great fucking book. Uh, well, it's wait, what's, what's the so book many called? people from Hay- Hayakians to Foucault. <laughs> wait, wait, what's the book called? Seeing by a state. See, see, seeing like a state. Seeing like a state by seeing like James, a state. James C. Scott. Are you a fan yeah. of that book, Simon? And I know you were going to say something earlier as well. Yeah, no, no, I am. I. Um, Scott came when I was faculty at Indiana. Scott came and gave um, uh, the series of like whatever was fancy, fancy lectures. It was wonderful. Um, one of my colleagues said it, re- it reminded her of the of uh, Rousseau's second discourse. Right? It was you know let's let's go um, let's go way back to something wonderful that existed before we started you know planning our, our states. And so that that would be the the kind of reductio for Scott. Um, but uh, no, I, I I I'm just struck by this. Response and I'm sorry I didn't I didn't catch our interlocutor's name who who's who's our new guy on the on the feed so sorry this is, uh, so this is Ostov. Ostov, uh, Ostov, I'm gonna, yes. and I'm gonna say it in Russian Nadezhdy which means ah. hope all right or rather hopes the plural hopes for some reason I'm not sure why but uh, <laughs> there we go 
I mean, also, so it's, I mean, I, what, I, what I think about, and what, what you led me to think about in this case was, you know, every religion, at least in the whatever post-axial age, has a uh, prohibition against idol worship, right? This, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the creation of one's best image of God and the replacement of God by that, by that image. And that, that is, you know, maybe the thing that brings together a whole bunch of these uh, you know, let's call them attractors, right? These sort of places where one never escapes. Um, I think zero is gone, right? I'll just, I'll just yeah. show you. Here's, here, here, here's our map. This is our map of the ideological network of the red pill. At least is how we're, how we're, how we're working wow. on it. Uh, it's a so you know, machine learning is coming. But um, one of the things we notice, right, is you know, a classic example. Of this is the incels, right? The incels mm -hmm. are rationalists, except instead of Bayesian reasoning, it's like this kind of bullshit pseudo evo psychology. And so, you know, they, they find themselves, you know, or they, they convince themselves that they're structurally incapable of reproduction or survival or love or whatever it is. And so at that point, what do you do, right? Uh, jump off a bridge, uh, you, you, you know, shoot up a shopping mall. I, there's obviously there's, you know, a spectrum there, right? You, you really, also just really disappear. Right? A little bit back on that. As yeah, go, go Geo, please, yeah. As an incel myself. <laughs> <laughs> The, the playtime is uh, bold sell, Gio, but yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm only kidding, but maybe unless. No, <laughs> I think th this comes up a lot. The, even today, actually, I was tweeting with a lo-fi Republican. And if you um, shout out to my boy, lo-fi Republican, if you go on any of his insult tweets, it's like this sea of uh, DSA people that are like quote tweeting it and saying mm -hmm. that, you know, I can't believe this. I think I, ha I have... What I would push back on is the again the the real desire is not the true desire. I think that the problem with the incel thing is that it's too it got too involved with like the Pua Manosphere stuff, which is largely this what some would call a bastardization of Evo Psych, right? So it's a lot of like why is um you know SMV uh, why are you know the eighty twenty rule, which I mean is by and large kind of it, it's kind of true, right? If you look at the statistics, I don't I think. I think Tinder. The uh, game uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we can, yeah. we could, we can, we can battle that one out to you. But no, sorry, no, go no, on, no. go on, go on. Yeah. What I would say is that the, the mischaracterization of the incel is about a brute um, commodification of desire itself. That that is what I said today, actually, with Little Five Republican. I said the problem is that the framing of it as like, okay, the incel cannot reproduce, and it's purely about sexuality and so forth. The problem is that they're trying to express a longing of being left out in more intangible reality of love and affection and care you know even like in the heideggerian sense of care of being socially mm -hmm. involved so the problem is that you know this sort of um what would you say you know let's let's go down like all of like what us on the right wing we call you know atomization modernity so forth whatever buzzword you want to say modernity yeah so uh. The problem is like the, the capacity for like rootless atomized modernity to commodify those intangible feelings outside of some like dystopian horrific of like, you know, equilibrium drugs and, and uh, you know, you're going to like basically GP3 and, and Gans yourself and CRISPR yourself, the perfect uh, trad waifu or something like that. I mean, apart from some kind of like sci-fi dystopian scenario, there is in some sense, no accurate measure of what the incel is lacking, or rather the capacity for yeah, society yeah. to, yeah. So I no, think- but let me, let me, let me jump in here, Jay. I think this is- Okay, go I, ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Do not show <laughs> Lucas's room. Don't, don't. Oh, no. Wow, that is, that is the Hegelian Lucas's room. Um, oh, it's the yeah. Lucas's room that, that oh, indeed God. reflects upon itself. It's fractaling um, too. It is, it is the Lucas's room of, Luke, uh, this is like a zero HP. So, uh, so oh. you know, I, I, I think it's really useful to separate two things, right? One yes, is the yeah. psychoanalysis of somebody who mm. ends up in these groups, and the other yes. is the genealogy of the group, right? Because, yeah, yeah, yes. And I think this is very true. And so I, I, you know, I want to, I want to really separate these out because you know, there's many reasons that people will join an ideology or sign on to an ideology in this era of, let's say, quasi-voluntary ideology. And so one can we can talk about the sociological emergence of this thing one could subscribe to, but then also, and I think you're talking about this deeper point, which is the psychoanalytic problem. Um, you know, my point of view, and I'll just lay this across the table here, right, is that you know these are incredibly damaging movements for people to get sucked into. 
Oh, no they doubt. have, no doubt. yeah, no doubt. And I, you know, I'm sure it's fine, right? When no one's getting cancer, right? So um, these are incredibly damaging movements. They, they ruin people's lives. They strike between 17 and 21, as far as we can tell. Um, and, but, you know, we can tell a very elaborate story. We have, you know, timestamp to the second, the last, what is it, you know, eight, nine, 10 years. And then we went back all the way to Usenet in the 90s where this began. So, you know, sociologically, enormous information here. But everybody wants to know, like, how do you get someone out? And not because we need to make them good servants of the capitalist state, but just because this is clearly fucking with someone's self-flourishing. But that's but this thing, is such a harder though, question. It's a deeper, yeah. harder question, right? But, but that's the thing, though. And I've often I've tweeted about this. I've wrote I've wrote two part articles about this. You can find it on my blog, right? Sure, um, sure. Mm-hmm. I about how the incel is the production of power knowledge itself. The, the incel is almost like um, becoming, in a sense, the docile body, the one that has to be surveilled yep. and regulated, right? So, yep. but when you say that, when you go to people that are ostensibly like you know. I mean, the new left, what is the new left anymore? But let's say like academic, like Varso type of like the new mm-hmm. left, right? If you go and you say to them, well, the incel, exactly the sort of policing of sexuality that Foucault was talking about. It's, oh no, oh my God, that's terrible. Why would you say that? That's like a total um, schizo, like that's a dangerous, evil right-wing assertion, right? To say to like hijack Foucaultian, like the power knowledge period and say, well, the incel is exactly the production of this sort of like discourse around the regulation and the norm, the normativization of sexual. Sorry, I'm mm-hmm. I'm just getting. I mean, it's not my. This is about you guys, so I'm. I, I talk too much. I talk. Geo, no, 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 no. Can no. you tell us? Can you tell us, Geo? Is the incel the last man? Is that is that the case? The, yes, the incel. Well, the I gooner is the last that, man. The, no, the gooner is the last man. The gooner is the <laughs> okay, last man. Right, right. But I would say the incel is a byproduct of the last. Wait, wait, Simon, uh, shaking head. Do you know what a gooner is? Uh, <laughs> no. Is it a, is it related to a goomba? <laughs> <laughs> Super Mario go, Mario. You know, it's kind of like that question: What is who is Chris Chan? It's like. What is a gooner? I'm I'm break the rules. It's like the question. <laughs> Lev, please educate professor, yes. the good professor. So we're, we're the actually good developing a bingo a game. Is. We're developing a bingo game, and I think gooner will probably be the free pass. I mean, what the, is uh, a gooner? Free yes. space. Yes. Is the free okay. Space. So gooners are people who have multiple monitors, either in the virtual reality space or in real life space, uh, splayed out with porn on all the monitors. They're watching the porn. They are pleasuring themselves to the porn with the goal of not coming or prolonging the experience of orgasm in order to stay within. Yeah, in order to stay within this gooned out state. Uh, where they become one with uh, their uh, penis, so to speak, and completely forget about any any other thing that's going on in the world. And they say and- that it brings them a heightened state of awareness after a few hours where literally the slightest touch will bring them to a monumental orgasm. <laughs> Guys, I, I, I didn't used to believe in trigger warnings. <laughs> yeah, now what I is do. it? <laughs> Dude, but they I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm 100% in. I'm 100% in. <laughs> Um, and, this is this is my Ovid's metamorphoses, and, and there's a whole uh, community. There's a whole community around them too on Reddit and so forth on Discord. They have Discord oh, calls, God. Oh, God. fifty I people just... deep, where they're all gooning together. So you hear this like blur of this brave new world that has such people in it. <laughs> I I I this wow. All right, I some gotta, of them I have mean, VR rigs yeah. where they have like a. Yeah. Um, like, like that the end scene of, of the Truman Show where it's all those yeah. monitors. It's like, well, well, Simon, if you can hook us up with one of those, yeah. uh, not cattle prods, but like one of those things with the uh, with the hook on the side so we can capture one of the gooners and bring them to Carnegie <laughs> Mellon University. <laughs> the dog for, for study. <laughs> Gosh, we're, we're, doing yeah. this, we're doing this for science. Uh, yeah, have, uh, I, do we, do we want to maybe like throw a bone to any of the people asking questions in the chat? Maybe absolutely. Yes, yes, of course. I, yeah, I mean, I have fun. not, I have not seen yeah. any super chats as of yet. So, guys, step it on the super chats. But despite that, we are going to answer the questions that are already there. But anyway, let's go through some of the questions. So, which ones do you see, Geo? I know that there was an earlier one from Zero HP about yes. about a uh, Bronze Age. Uh, Zero HP is not here right now, but I want to make sure that that is answered. Uh, he, uh, he um, this this was about um, <clears throat> Chaos Prime's thread. Um, yeah, that's where I live tweeted my read through of Bronze Age Mindset. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember that thread. Yeah, that was good. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, it, was, it was quite we'll a, that a little bit. Yeah, let, oh, let's well, I would, go with the next question. 
Oh. I'm I'm trying to see. Uh, he asked. Um, okay. Everybody Maybe subscribe while well, Geo's. <laughs> Until you've read Moldbug Prove Obama Birtherism using Bayesian rules, you have not grappled with the true Bay Area national rationalism. Um, I, I don't see I don't see it, Lev, but I think uh, ZHP was just asking um, for a summation of uh, wait, he says bad things happen with falsifiable information starts so getting used to. Oh, here I found it. I found it. A uh, oh, question good, for good. chaos. I enjoyed your thread on bronze age mindset. How does that figure into the cognitive arms race? Yeah. And if you could, if you could mm. link it, um, chaos, if you could link it into the chat, then, then right. Lev will link it into the comment yes. into the BTR chat. So right. mm -hmm. yeah. Give me a second. No, uh, pull that up. Buff stolen valor femoids. Are fem cells real? No, stolen valor. <laughs> and guys, if you had any, I, questions I've been that... told. I've been told on good authority that fem cells are in fact real, but that's just more life decisions that never. <laughs> what, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Fem cells have a, a community that is just as you know strong a cognitive attractor and just as as toxic as as incels. That's right. That's right. But yeah. what do you? They, they call us moids. Yes, uh, as, moids. As retaliation for femoids. <laughs> but what do you think but I, I guess this is for all of us here what do you think of um the original impetus of a lot of these internet communities being largely driven by anonymity and now that that sort of uh wants to well rather the people you know the powers that be they want to sort of like disappear this with TikTok. Uh, i read this article from the from the walrus you know i've mentioned this before where they, they talk about how zoomers are using TikTok, and we're going to get rid of like the evil terrible dark um you know the dark reality of anonymity on the internet because people are just going to uh see each other's faces all the time and their real names but i i wonder though is the mutually enforced sort of consensus thinking around these communities is that more enforced by anonymity or is it easier for sort of like for example in 4chan you go to any like thread where it's like the typical like i don't know paul or r9k way of thinking like all oh, these evil you know evil women evil uh you know which ethnic group i don't have to say it but well, speaking but of speaking of will... evil women we have alex plotnik in the chat over here shout out to alex oh nice nice shout out friend of the show she's not um, an evil woman she, she's great yeah god, god love her <laughs> um yes but uh, she is she is actually a very phenomenal artist as well um yes so but I wonder, there are people that disrupt these threads that say that you people are a bunch of like angry, bitter incels that live in your basement and so forth. So I wonder if the sort of the disruption of a lot of these communities is almost more interesting, like the, the, the discursive disruption of these communities and the narratives that they set for themselves. I wonder if that's even like a thing if that's it's if that's strengthened by anonymity or if we're going to have to like go back to, I don't know, where like some dystopian nightmare where like we're all docs and everyone knows you know the in, even to access the internet you have to like have your ip address attached to your real name and face and so forth so i i wonder if like uh yeah sorry i'm just riffing well, i mean I, th I think in the, in the anonymous communities we saw that you know where disruption is a routine occurrence then it learned you know the community learns to cope with it um you know it, it doesn't say like oh you know we need to you know have everybody be uh, a name friend so that you know we can you know, get rid of those bad disruptors and learns to work around disruption uh which you know is probably a useful skill hmm. well there's, there's, a, there's, true, a, there's a flip side here i was going to say mm -hmm. jump in right it's, it's uh so we have running a god for you know help us right we, we we're running something on 4chan as well um you compare 4chan to reddit um you know the ideological network on 4chan is just sort of non-existent right um, as far as we can tell, there, there's not a lot of, uh, let's say, assembly, creative assembly, whatever, creative destruction. It's, uh, you know, we were sort of talking about it's like a, like a kind of yeah, bacterial culture. Um, well, for, I, who knows? Who knows who these yeah. people are, right? It, it could be, you know, one, mm -hmm. one giant, you know, one guy, right? Well, when you're uh, looking at 4chan, by the but, way, are you um, looking at all of 4chan or just poll? Yeah. <laughs> We are we are looking at Paul. Oh, listen, Paul uh, is all Paul. of 4chan now. I hate to say that. <laughs> Here we are, right? Here we are. It's um, but if you look at you know, you look at the Reddit sites, I mean this is a crucial thing. It's the difference between anonymity and pseudonymity, right? Which you guys all know. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, it, this, this came up earlier, right? The, the role of hierarchy of status seeking. Um, you can't seek status if, if there's no tie to an identity or persistent identity. So there's, there's something, there's some limitation that we have on pure anonymity. You know, then you have the pseudonymity thing, right? But you have these, you know, multiple identities, throwaway accounts. There's this extreme you have of, you know, real person, whatever, like social security number, agent, you know, sort of subject of the state. And you wonder what's the spectrum, right? We may at some point have a kind of Bitcoin or Urbit like identity, which is pseudonymous, but persistent, hard to reject. Um, that's a, it's a good question. What, what, what happens to the development of, you know, let's call them these cognitive traps to, to go back or cognitive arms or landmines to go back to chaos is uh, to opening. Rachel Hayaware always makes fun of me for using the phrase cognitive uh, uh, attractors or kind of cognitive attractor basins. But that's, you know, I, I see a lot of things uh, that way as like, you know, the incel community is a, a, a huge cognitive attractor base and has a, a, a tremendous gravity well. People get mm -hmm. sucked into it and, you know, it, it like something that might have been, you know, essentially a phase uh, becomes part of identity, uh, becomes a crab bucket exercise. Uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, That's exit. a good one, yeah. Uh, so. But I, I wonder, though, again, we have to always examine the normative assumptions of like why, for example, I mean, the biggest one, the one that really sticks into my craw um, is the, the the discourse around the radicalization narrative and how it only goes one way when really really if you look at the radicalization model it really is it it has the potential to be an objective model regardless of political ideology but it, the fact that it's deployed against like this ghost of the alternative right that is you know it's really for ideological purposes within itself but when you look at it objectively it is true there is sort of a number of cognitive booby traps that happen where people get into this way of thinking and it's very rigorously self-regulating too because mm -hmm. you know for example in 4chan and you know this professor from your research i mean if you stray from the narrative a bit then it's like you're a fed you're a jew you're <laughs> you're um mm -hmm. it, it, it's a self-reinforcing sort of uh yeah. narrative of i i don't want to say narrative of paranoia because i I think that's a way to discredit um, conspiracy theory as such as a valid alternative ontology. It's not really paranoia, is it? It's it's yeah. regulation. It's it's yeah. you know again like you know it's defining the boundaries of what's an acceptable identity in the space. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it reminds me a little bit of I'm just thinking about like this is years ago, right? Walking through Washington Square Park, right? Mm. And you know, people are constantly offering you drugs. This is like you know, ages ago, right? Before Bitcoin. Um, one of the things you see on 4chan, right, is that there are so many people trying to sell this stuff. So we almost see it's it's a it's a surplus of sellers, meaning people trying to sell whatever bizarro uh, theory they have, and the Jews always get it, right? So whatever bizarre anti-Semitic theory, you know, anti anti whatever uh, theory that uh, this these far outnumber the buyers, right? So there's there's far more. Uh, it's it's almost like this is a group entirely consisting of um you know like who are they even speaking to i suppose is the right question it reminds me a little bit of uh you know contemporary poetry there are more people writing poetry literally than reading it mm -hmm. yes. there may be more people writing you know people facts. in mfa programs than there are people buying the uh, yeah this well, is like i mean like the worst thing you could say about fortune it's like it's kind of like an mfa program right maybe that's the way <laughs> this is, finally dies right is that it's oh, you know yeah. wow I mean, this is yeah, yeah. fortune is over now so. That's it. Oh, man. So, I mean, that's so, one thing we miss, right? Is we, we, we think of it as this one guy dealing or, you know, a couple of people dealing it. We actually, there's a competition to be dealers because, of course, yeah. with, with dealership comes power. And we, we have it in this well, yeah, you know, I I think, um, scenario in like, we have all these people bouncing around, essentially looking for meaning, looking for purpose. Um, and, you know, trying out one thing, it doesn't work, trying out the next thing. Like one of the, the strongest moves you can make in that milieu is to make, you know, whatever your thing is difficult to escape. You, you mm -hmm. make it so that like in order to enter, you have a barrier to exit. Um, and right. you know, I think Fear we're going to see more and more of that coming along because it's you know, evolutionarily advantaged in the situation. Well, is, that's one of the memes on 4chan as well, where uh, Mr. Burns points the sign that says, don't forget, you're here you're forever. Here forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopeful, Bannon, you, you had something to say. Yeah, I think... Um... Well, in a lot of like real name communities, right, 
get ideas that are generated by uh, intellectual authorities. And so like you might have academia informs a lot of ideas on how society works and that kind of percolates down. And in an anonymous forum, you don't really have the weight of your reputation to back that up, but you do still have these memes trying to spread through people's brains and you know become dominant in that space. And so I think a lot of people discovered that really the only thing you need is to have a good understanding of what's uh, you know viral mimetically. Right. Uh, and so you get mm -hmm. anyone feels like they can push the next meme and they can make it take off. And this you is get where things like comes right. from, yeah. which is which is why for yeah they are right uh, so effective for you know foment fermenting memes for brewing things up that are going to you know go out into the world and wreak havoc. But if those yeah, memes sometimes were it's completely as empty, as... well. If they well, were completely empty, then p people wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't register. So there is still a dissatisfaction that people feel that makes them spread. I mean, you know, the idea of a forced meme. It, a forced meme is not going well, to last. Well, corporations are trying to create forced yeah. memes now. But well, sorry, there's hopefully no we'll go on. Difference go on. Between a, yeah, there's no ben, real ben difference, I think, something. between a forced meme and an unforced one. I mean, a classic meme is, you know, something like uh, Sakura eating a fish every day. And it's literally just a guy who posted the same picture every single day. And now that's like an iconic image that's burned into everyone's brains. It doesn't matter if it was forced or not. You know, it still ended up becoming uh, colonizing people's minds in that same way. And a so forced, there's all kinds meme, of... A forced meme is a marketing campaign. A meme yeah. that, you know, it goes has beyond the force level it. is a marketing campaign that people talk about around the water cooler. I think uh, forced and unforced is like ascribing intention to the uh, progenitor of the meme, but I don't think that it makes much of a difference ultimately once the mm. meme ex uh, escapes mm. beyond that context. Interesting. And there's all kinds of people running ops on 4chan now. I mean, yeah. uh, Simon DeDio, you're basically running an op uh, for all that's worth. Is <laughs> when you're doing you're the studies. still. <laughs> you're I don't want to call still. you a... <laughs> we, 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 do, we do no intervention. Uh, no, no, no. We, we would need many ethics approvals to, to intervene in any of yes, these Yes, it's coming, coming of age and fortune. Oh, God. Well, coming I mean, observation Samoa. is uh, intervention. You know, you're changing the result by measuring it. But yeah. there's definitely you're uh, just you're yeah. just you're just helping the bureaucracy of ethical <laughs> approval here by making these there's arguments. already uh, you. all kinds yeah. of federal, but, the, the, but the narrative you know, officers like, you have to surveil like you have to ethically surveil the incels the wild <laughs> pygmy incels on the internet it's it's <laughs> It's, no, uh, no, this, this, this is, is something. No, I, I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this is sort of a serious question. We talk about this a lot. Like, what does it mean to treat people with respect, mm -hmm. uh, regardless? That's sort of the fun one thing, right? You know, you, you're going to study Nazis. You know, the university ethics says you've got to treat them with equal respect. There's nothing you can do here. Right. And we think about this a lot. Like, what does it mean um, to reflect back a community onto itself? Mm. Uh, there's huge vested interests on every side, right? Um, there, uh, you know, there's a lot of correct conclusions one can come to. So we're under, you know, pressure. And from even that. the framing and... itself, like, like being a documentarian, like the way, like mm. Louis Thoreau, for instance, like he he edges towards like a critique, but at the end of the day, it's still like, look at the freaks, like it's like a more sophisticated. We don't want to do that. You don't want to yeah, do that exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, like that's... our 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 goal is universal or universalizable. Let's say knowledge, general principles, mm -hmm. and ideally, you know, at at some point, we have a synoptic study yes. of this. Yeah. And a deep um, of... It just so happens, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's 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 partly because many of the left wing groups have much sort of tighter connections to the wider yes. world, right? Yeah. So you know, if you're if you're a lefty edge lord, you have you know you, you, you get can sponsored end up by Google, in, you know, Descent Magazine. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I don't want to go that far, right? But yeah, I mean, it's Google. well, there or was or a, you the, have a, the young Turks, you have a podcast for example. that makes eighty grand a month, and your father yeah. used to be the editor of the Wall Street Journal. So I no, wonder no. who I'm subtweeting the yeah. no, Chapo I mean, Trap House. No, I mean, I'm look, like uh, the young the young <laughs> Turks, you know, in that uh, yeah, or, in that, or the young episode, Turks that would be another in one. that episode where Alex Jones invaded their studio and got into uh, Sang Huger's face. But the young Turks, <laughs> they had a podcast that was, you know, there was the Google sign right above in that studio. And again, this is like an organization of people associated with the uh, Turkish government and Hassan Piker, you know, even more left leaning, uh, you know, being the nephew. <laughs> but, no, of but Lev, I, we are being uncharitable because the young Turks did generally like they were a DIY, like alternative news source for the time being at the, like at least the 2010s. But, but yeah, sorry, we cut you off, uh, professor. Uh, well, I, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a, uh... 
you know, the, gosh, I mean, there's so many pieces here, right? One is, yeah, we think about this a lot. In fact, the first place I studied was Wikipedia. And, uh, you know, people are very badly behaved on Wikipedia and very well behaved. And so we had to figure out, okay, how do you talk about bad behavior without essentially doxing somebody <laughs> uh, or, you know, at least drawing attention to, to somebody? And so that, these, are, these are really interesting questions, right? You want to go, we see ourselves in some ways like anthropologists. Um, you go, you try to understand, but then the one thing you don't want to do is go native. So um, there's a lot of temptation to sympathize with people because you just see, you know, you feel, like I hate to say, you, you feel sorry for them. They're often much younger. You, 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 you see that. And that's, again, it's, an, it's another one of these, one of these dangers, right? So um, I don't know how to, how to put those pieces together. It's just, I mean, you, you, you bring up this hot button issue of the, the ethics of it, the ethics of studying people. What does it mean to study people who've lost their minds? Maybe that's the right way to say it. Uh, historically, like Foucault had got lucky, right? He could study people who lost their minds a hundred years ago. But um, yeah. if we want to ask questions today about people at least temporarily losing their minds, that's a, uh, this is a normative question to me. Well, there are all kinds of gradients here in terms of a mind either being lost or a mind being on the verge of being lost when people are surrounded by things like on 4chan, you know, people always use the term clown world. I think that's become popular at around, like, when was a Geo? Like, 2019? Is that around um, the I believe, the of... well, it, it came, okay, clown world came originally from probably my... Po I'm not going to say salad forums. I'm probably going to say my posting career. That's original. Like MPC forums was the original place of clown ward. Then it was taken up by, um, I remember this because I was a part of Thermidor magazine at the time where it became popular along with the term bug man, which was also created by both Sallow and MPC forums. Uh, so at the time clown, cl the clown world thing was, I would say around 20, 20, 17, 18, 19, uh, was when it, sort of crept up from like forum culture like really like far-right forum culture into uh i want to say in part when we were doing a thermometer magazine we talked about this uh social matter had article articles about it um and then later now like mainstream people say like put the clown like the the beeble art piece that sold for nine million dollars uh has the clown emoji in it against donald trump and donald trump ostensibly was like a harbinger of the, the clown world meme itself as like a postmodern political artist, like the <laughs> aestheticization of mm. politics. But it's it's really crazy how, again, that was like a forum culture meme that percolated up mm. to like, now like yeah, everyone but, knows. Yeah, you go let, ahead, go let, ahead. Yeah, let, me, let me ask you, it's, I mean, I, I'm gonna say this, I don't mean this in a bad way, who cares, right? So why yeah, do we actually well, care about that? Um, it's, I, it's, I, it's I offer, it's our I don't history. Know why. It's our <laughs> unique no, 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 I, I can offer history. Like, other than ah. well, other than the art history aspect of it, I can offer another reason as to why uh, people should. Uh, well, well, it care. is like because it's like what people say, like, "Oh, this is a white supremacist." Like Peppy the Frog is a white supremacist yeah. meme. So no, but but, but it's it. not. It's not even just like, that. Like it's I saw this moderator, yeah. like he's a top moderator for Twitch, saying that like maybe people shouldn't use a Peppy emoji on Twitch, right? So go, well, here, go I mean, it's kind of like what Pylos uh, wrote right now in the chat. You're being mm -hmm. gaslit by priests in white robes to be happy with your condition. I mean, this kind of mm -hmm. comes to why I say, like, you know, some people have uh, been frank hassled out of their minds and some are <laughs> uh, gradually in, in the way, too, because I really do think, like, the more of these conversations that we have here on BTR the more I think it is important to get to the core of not so much clown world as in how it's represented in the art form like Gio was talking about, but more so what are the primary root causes, like the reasons why people even talk about a clown world to begin with? Because yeah. the big, the big uh, separation I see and what BTR is also trying to uh, undivide in its own way by bringing a lot of people mm -hmm. from the mainstream together with people from more of the underground internet cultures is that people are concerned about things happening, you know, within, or at least uh, as they appear to be happening to them within the communities in terms of like, you know, issues like migration, issues like, you know, the nature of uh, government control, all these, uh, you know, academia, all these various things people get really concerned about, and they bring up various uh articles that talk about you know things that you know what gender reassignment of young kids you know th things of that nature and they keep bringing that up and talk about now we are in this clown world and well, it's nobody like a black cares. pill 
Yeah. It's it's like a way of almost like a weird there are people who do it better than others. It's like a weird performance art of black pilling that I, I personally think, and this is my opinion, and I will die by this opinion. My thesis is that nobody TM the visual art, the video artist basically started a lot of this trend of like, you know, even like the most mainstream example being like, I don't know, Paul Joseph Watson videos where it's like, this is modernity. It's a picture of like, drag time story hour with like vaporwave music uh, that was just a bastardization of nobody tim mm. but anyways I, yeah it's a it's but nobody sort but of... nobody in the mainstream even gives an inch even gives an inch to any of the problems that uh, these people are bringing up and to me that's always and been the, pretty but sus then the counter the counter force being is that there are people who become like obsessive yeah to the level of psychosis around like you know, well, because no, nobody brings it up right. with them. They're in a circle and they're uh, circling the wagons because there isn't somebody to go up to them and to talk with them and to actually break down a lot of these things that they're seeing problems with. I mean, this is, again, something that I think Break the Rules is doing in its own way. But that's another thing that I'm interested in. Like, uh, Simon, would you be interested in examining not just 4chan, but also examining the uh, PMCs, the professional managerial class people, <laughs> the people who work at NPR? You know, because that is another very interesting thing to look at where they are so separated, like they're just like the polar opposite of whatever conversations mm -hmm. are going on in this culture that talks about clown world. Nobody within that culture would even utter anything mm -hmm. close to the sentiments of uh, people who talk about clown world. And I find that to be very interesting. Like, do people, when they see certain things going on, do they just reject it? Do they choose not to think about it? Do they think, oh, like, uh, uh, it's not a big deal? I mean, I know that people who are older than I am, who were, you know, uh, in the Soviet Union, who have experienced a lot of horrible things, they look at a lot of the things that are happening mm -hmm. right now as more of a swinging of the pendulum to the other side, and then they say, okay, it's swinging this way, things are very woke right now, and later on it's going to go back uh, to uh, like a different direction and then just going to keep going on like that. So mm -hmm. maybe I think their perspective is right here, but not even that is talked about so much within this professional managerial class. Like it's almost like it's not there. They choose to completely ignore any of it. And I guess my problem is that because they ignore and because they always end up putting the worst qualities into like imbuing the worst qualities in a lot of these 4chan people they are going to start to mimic a lot of those worst qualities. So almost like, oh, you call me a Nazi. Well, I'm going to, uh, you know, now I'm going to become one. You know, it's like one of those uh, <laughs> unfortunate things end up happening over time through this, like, miscommunication or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I just don't know um, how exactly that could be treated. But, uh, well, treated, that's such a, that's such a medicalized uh, term for this thing. But I would love to hear from you, Simon, and Chaos, and uh, Ostaf as well about yeah, this yeah. particular phenomenon. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there's, when you, you talk about this uh, sort of ordinary discourse, or uh, we used to call them, I think it was GII, general interest intermediaries, like Time Magazine, right, um, that are sort of, you know, they, they're, they're shelling points, right, they're, they, they serve as something that everyone's reading, and we all know that everyone's reading them. Uh, we all know that everyone knows that everyone's reading them. It's, you know, the Seinfeld of, of communication. And that, that was, you know, that things work like that for a very long time. It, it would be very interesting to study, like, let's take the New York Times, for example, um, as it fades away from being this, this shelling point of agreement, we all know that that's the standard belief, how it fades away and can we, can we detect that? It's an absolutely legitimate question. It's a very interesting one. Um, you know, why study the subcultures? I mean, two things. One is they're much larger. It's a very different kind of thing. The, you know, NPR's... Um, you know, the hiring process at NPR, sure, it's wrapped up in, I don't know, like the you know, Harvard Crimson or something, right? But it's small. It's like 100 people at most, maybe 10 who are deciding what's happening. When you get these bottom-up systems like, you know, subreddits, uh, that's a totally different thing. You have 300,000 authors, 3 million posts. You only see one of them. So very different kind of production process. Um, I mean, one thing you ask is, why don't people study the PMC uh, more? I guess you're going to call it PMC. I just, I, you know, I'm not a sociologist. Um, you know, I think there's, uh, gosh, 
Um, and we can leave that one aside. Why, why, why it doesn't get studied more? Certainly, once it's over, it gets studied. So you know, we have plenty of time to study neoliberalism <laughs> now that NPR is to study. Well, you know, has decided by the time it ends, the sun will explode. Right? So don't worry about. <laughs> we <won't> <laughs> well, yeah. So I mean, there's some, there's some great critical work done on this. Uh, you know, looking at um, and I just think of neoliberalism as a lovely book that's just come out of it. Uh, so you know, it isn't that these don't come under scrutiny, but Lev, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not speaking to your, to your question as directly as I might. So am I, or? No, I think, I think it is a pretty close to what I have in mind. I'm just curious about when it comes to a lot of, uh, not even the people who work at the New York times or NPR so much as the Mm -hmm. listeners, because, uh, you know, I was at a party a couple of years ago where, you know, people had their NPR tote bags and they were repeating very similar talking points to the ones that I've heard in other places. I mean, that is a very established thing. You know, people listen to the same thing. Mm-hmm. They come to the same conclusion. Well, it's become a status symbol. I think an intellectual status symbol as well. Mm. Like I read, the you know, reading the New York Times or no, what, what goes beyond that? Maybe like reading, I don't know, have subscribing to uh I guess the Wall Street Journal in certain places is like this, you know, it's a form of intellectual signaling, I guess. Well, for, for example, like on a maybe it's like a having different... a sub stack around these. Places. Sure. But <laughs> like on a, on, a, on a different note, let's say there's like all these economists and they talk about, you know, all of these various things having to do, you know, Wall Street Journal, yada, yada, yada. And then somebody shouts out, you know, uh, the Federal Reserve is evil down with the Fed. You know, we should have had, a, mm-hmm. you know, we should have had our money in gold. And this is like the ruin of the em- and everybody looks at them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you fucking psycho. Get at, get out of here. Get away. You. We don't want to yeah, have yeah. anything to do with you, even though a lot of these points were things that were talked about, you know, by legitimate economists, you mm-hmm. know, like uh, if we're talking about, you know, Ludwig von Mises back in the day, you know, that's not some tinfoil hatter over here. Well, actually, and... in, ec- in economic circles, that is tinfoil. <laughs> well, see, that's that's yeah. the interesting thing to me to look at. Like, why is it that certain systems like these, they exclude any of the criticism that, let's say, would be leveled out on sites like 4chan when it comes to certain cultural deterioration that they're seeing? And uh, or if we're talking about the economic side of it, why is it that these particular branches of economics uh, are the ones that are, you know, the doors close in their face? Like there seems to be a force yeah. kind of uh, preventing the, these kind of conversations from happening, almost like they they spoil the party. I don't know. At least that, that that's the vibe. Is it, is it like, you know, so you're trying to play a game of poker and somebody comes in and, and like, you know, puts down their tarot deck and like, like, would, you know, you're just, you're just doing something else, dude. Like, I don't know what you're doing, but it's not what we're doing in this room. You know? We think about this. I, I remember this years ago now, um, I don't know, some review of one of Noam Chomsky's books, right? I mean, infinite number of books. Um, and, you know, they were said, well, you know, he, he really criticizes the New York Times, his manufactured consent. But of course, all of his factual accounts also come from the Times, right? Mm-hmm. Um, same with the Arvin, right? You know, this sort of hardcore NRX stuff, right? It, you know, on the one hand, this is a gigantic matrix that you're stuck in. He's going to rip you out. On the other hand, all of the facts that underlie this come from this place, right? So there's, you know, there's this kind of double problem here where, you know, as a physicist, you would say, all they can do is sort of linear perturbations away from consensus reality. So you have to accept 99% of what's in the New York Times before you can like red pill people on the last 1%. So there, there's something kind of deeply phony about that, obviously, um, <laughs> that, you know, is, 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 is happening. Chomsky maybe is, you know, he's operating in a different era when the Times was. I was... love how you just body Chomsky. And <laughs> right there. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, so that's, I mean, we, we see this in conspiracy theories, right? Like the problem with the conspiracy theory is you have to keep widening the conspiracy and you know, you know, the, you know the real this, snap comes, go on, you, go on, Gio, go on, go on. No, this reminds yeah. me of a, a very excellent point. I, not to brag, but he is, I don't know how you feel about him, but he is certainly a very mm-hmm. good person. And a, mm-hmm. I would even say a friend online. Uh, but I was on Jeffrey Miller's podcast, Outsider Theory. And uh, he, we were talking about the proto schizo poster Francis E. Deck Esquires, and and mm-hmm. uh, at the very end, I was you know going into uh, he brought up Tusk and and I brought you know of course Deleuze and Foucault and so forth and like but at the very end he asked me the question, if you listen to it, uh, he's like you know Gio the thing is with like gang stalking people or other 
conspiracy communities is that they're using internet technology, but they're using it in their mental framework is of a much older model of um, basically like, you know, later half 20th century telecommunications, uh, you know, the cathode ray, the, the, the cell phone tower, so forth. But yet at the same time, they're expressing their theories about a totalizing conspiracy through the medium of the even vaster telecommunication, which is the internet. So why mm -hmm. is it that they preclude the technology of like posting on blogs or on Reddit or what r yeah, slash mm -hmm. gang stalking? Why is that not like another expression of the conspiracy? Which I mean, if, if you actually study it, it is because of like algorithm control and monitoring mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. So why is it that the, the sort of the schizo poster conspiracy theorists why did they omit that level of technology it's like you know mold bugs saying well you know the cathedral institutions are corrupt and so forth and they're your chomsky condensed building yet it's like you know here is this um book that's registered in the library of congress and i can access it and mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's it's almost of the same thing it's like you have to sort of omit certain um, certain inconvenient truths about the nature of even getting to a basis of quote unquote alternative fact to begin with. So I don't know. It mm -hmm. is a, a really and weird it's like this. It's like the Zarathustra track. fantasy, right? Where you can you can start thinking without anybody, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you can you can form as an account of the world, an image of the world, without relying on anybody. If, you know, the flip side is if your conspiracy theory is so vast, right, as it is, and perhaps the most compelling ones are cognitive reasons for that, right? If your conspiracy is so vast, you literally can't think with anybody else because everybody's in on it, right? So there's no shared reality yeah. for your words. It's almost like, you know, mm -hmm. people in the box. It's private language at that point. I've so... Yeah, go on. Sorry, Liv. No. I mean, think of how different it would be, and I understand the reasons why they didn't do it. But just for a second, mm -hmm. imagine the world where there would have been a news reporter that would have said, you know what? We don't know what exactly like these weird uh, messages that John Podesta sent out were. There's like some weird pizza map thing going on here. I wish he could just explain what these things are, you know, like, let's, but at least let's have a baseline that these are unusual sayings and let's just leave it at that. What I don't like is that when people jump the gun so much as to make conclusions without verifiable evidence, while at the same time, things like, I don't know, like Bohemian Grove, for you, instance. You just, right? you, you, you just, you just want more, more cognitive freedom than is compatible with a stable society. I think that's what, that's what the mm -hmm. times would say. I think that's what the journalists would say. Um, you want, you want to think in an unfettered way, right? Uh, publicly. And it, that's, that just can't work, right? We actually can't have that kind of epistemological stance towards the world because things would actually collapse. I think this is something, my guess is journalists think about this a great deal. Not the ones, not the science journalists, they're barrels, they're great, right? But people who, you know, journalists who consider themselves important members of, you know, the Hobbesian Leviathan. I think there's just, there's like, look, there's just gotta be limits to cognitive freedom. Um, people are getting, I think, more and more comfortable saying that in part because the the level of freedom of thinking has, has you know, because of online behavior has just gone through the roof, right? So they're confronted increasingly with, you know, a kind of French Revolution level of democracy, except now it's a different form, right? It's a free thinking. So when you say, hey, why can't I think this? I, I want, you know, let's let's do this. Um, I think that's that's probably the response. There's no good argument not to do that from first principles epistemically it's only normative it's political and just to be clear i'm not they even, even talking said about, about substack recently there was this article about how it's going to destroy journalism and it's going to promote like bad thinking or whatnot so, well, I mean, well, that's I mean, it. Yeah, just, yeah. Go on, I mean, yeah. just just to be clear here, I'm not talking about thinking about things to such an extent that, you know, you're leveling out things where, you know, like, how do I know this is true? Oh, because this 13th century guy wrote it down in the book. Well, how do you know that what he's saying is true? You know, at a certain point, like things just, uh, <laughs> you know, they you know what I'm talking about, you certain things, comes, they just yeah, kind of like, go, yeah, go into the ether where mm -hmm. we don't know. We don't know whether this 13th century guy actually saw what he.
he saw or whether he just made it up, you know, for scapegoating purposes, you know, things like blood libel, things of that nature. So when we're talking about a lot of these uh, these things like, uh, for example, Bohemian Grove, what I wish at least is for there to be a certain baseline that professional, rational journalists could just agree on and say, OK, like. What are some of the pieces of evidence that are brought forth for certain things like this? Okay, so there was this guy, Alex Jones. He went to uh, uh, videotape this structure. Now, could we say this structure was somehow uh, a prop that was made in the movie theater? No, because the trees or like the stage would match up to the image that you could find in Google Maps. So this would be like a physical structure that as a professional journalist, I would be able to identify like, yes, this exists here and this exists there. Uh, step two. There was that interview that he did with Ga David Gergen, that Jones did with David Gergen, who was this uh, CNN guy, former Clinton advisor, where Gergen himself said on camera that, well, you violated the code of yada, yada, yada by uh, <laughs> uh, was, talking that about was this. Great, yeah, yeah that go, was right. great. Don't don't talk about skull and bones. right? Let's yes, exactly. But but here I, we already I, have I, like the, the guy yeah. himself admitting things. So as rational journalists, let's put out and say as as a baseline. Well, we know that yeah, I know. But left... people meet. What, what, here's, here's what you remind me of, and I, I say this to somebody who, you know, like got halfway through Citizen. We did write a paper on the French Revolution. And um, what you sound like is one of these kind of middle of the road uh, guys in the revolution, kind of center left. And you're like, look, why don't we have, look, let's split the difference, right? Why don't we have like a kind of parliamentary, you know, monarchy where, you know, rational journalists, like, look, we don't want to slaughter the king. I mean, that's, come on, right? Like, <laughs> why why doesn't this work the way high school civics says it's meant to work? Um, like, you're like that guy, right? So you're not this, you're, you're not this person who says, okay, the people can't handle the truth. Uh, so we're just gonna, we're gonna kind of think for them. We're gonna do 90% of the thinking for them. You're like, well, can't, can't, can't the people who were, who are there right now do it? What you have is, I mean, you, you have this left, right let's call it the the cognitive left the roast of the of the room and that would be yarvin ironically enough someone like that just slaughter them all <laughs> right so that i mean metaphorically don't even you know just just walk away from it maybe exit and that's a key thing that we think is part of this nrx is exit so yes. stop trying to fix the system um you know and hopefully this is a maybe a comedic version of it no one actually there has doesn't actually have to be something in real space that happens it's just that these people exit as opposed to repair. So what you're talking about here a little bit is repair, but certainly many of these people online just don't want to go down that well, road. But, but which, me, which side needs like to a, be repaired though? Just, well, just well, exit's like a spiritual practice to me, but I, sure. it's, mm -hmm. well, that's the beauty of it. Lev is like the middle of the road, like <laughs> eat a row and I'm like Joseph de Maestra. And, <laughs> but, no. Well, no, no, I, um, I don't necessarily, the reason why I'm saying this, Simon, uh, it's yeah. not, it's not because my intention is to, you know, somehow change the way that the universe functions so that people I know they're not going to talk about that. What I, what I want to do, though, is send this out as a message to certain maybe more rebellious minded journalists to come on BTR who have a good reputation and to actually open mindedly talk about this, not even for the purpose of changing anything within their system, well, we, but we the, op the opposite. Week. We yeah. had last week, and she's in the chat right A Andrea, now. Yeah, Andrea Seabrook. Andrea Seabrook. That's, like, pretty – I mean, yeah. NPR. I recently discovered that she's actually mutuals with Barack Obama, <laughs> so that's pretty That's pretty high up. Absolutely. Like she was on C-SPAN. Oh, my God. But sorry, yeah. we're, we're no, tooting no, no, but, but again, like, I don't right want to – We have to move on. We need to toot but, our horn. Subscribe right now. Subscribe to BTR. <laughs> but anyway, the point the point that I'm getting to here, guys, is that I don't want to change the way this part of the system works. What I want to do is just to have certain clarities exist. And surprisingly, maybe not for the sake of the journos, but for the sake of the people who actually complain about a lot of this stuff. Because, again, coming from a generation that was under heavy handed communism with mm. things going on in that environment that I don't think anybody here could even begin to imagine what it's like to live under that kind of regime. I think mm -hmm. it is important to keep in mind that Bohemian Grove, all this stuff like maybe it's not as bad, meaning like there are these systems that are out there. Let's just be candid and honest about what exactly we know that goes on there. And let's just level it together with the other systems no, that nothing, exist right I, now. Not, try, nothing interesting happens at Bohemian Grove. <laughs> it's a lot of heavy drinking. <laughs> People put yeah, on some you know. shows. Uh, the women aren't allowed. It's yes. uh, it's you know I mean it's it's a pretty dull thing. But I you know what what I'm just struck by Lev is you know this 
when we do science, right, and we do this, you know, obviously science doesn't happen on stage and can't happen on stage in part because you have to be able to think anything, say anything. Um, you have, you know, you have to, so you, we would, you would either sound, you know, literally nuts if you're, you know, questioning the metaphysic, the ontology, you may, you may sound like a, like somebody, you know, on some extreme of the horseshoe if you're talking about social behavior. So you know, we have to think completely freely. Nothing can be off the table. We do that privately, I would say. But when you say, okay, hey, look, what if Bohemian Grove is actually, you know, sending mind control rays? I'm teasing you, love, but what, you know, let's, let's, let's bring that on the table. Um, you know, there's sort of two questions arise for me. One is, um, you know, I think many of the journalists would say, this is, you just can't do this publicly because it's, it's dangerous for this or that reason. It's, you know, there are vulnerable children in the room. Um, people would also say, look, we have limited time. Right. So, you know, we have to we're going to focus our epistemic labor on whatever it is, digging up the next scandal, running some more for you. Um, so, you know, there's something here about. Maybe sorry to. Well, it's more this, about releasing pressure, if that makes any no, sense. Love, love, let him finish. Yeah, OK, OK, OK. okay, okay, okay. okay. I mean, I, I, I think like as an academic, uh, extraordinary lucky because I get to spend time privately with really intelligent people. And we talk a huge amount. Nothing's off the table. That's that's you know, this great privilege. Um, so really, the question is, how do we reproduce this condition of freedom for the wider masses, right? Masses oh, are the word. Can't. No one's ordinary. But how do you? No, not me, man. I'm, I'm not. But how do you? How do you do that? Like, how do you? How do institutions grow for people so that they don't go off the rails? And then you say, right. So what are the functioning aspects? Of, of like a place like academia or the, you know, like whatever the Jesuits or whoever's, whoever's managed to create those spaces. So that's, that I think is maybe like what you're asking um, is not how do we fix the New York times, but how do we, you know, how do we create spaces that are, you know, enable cognitive flourishing for, you know, people who didn't manage to, you know, make it through the, the academic, let's say as one of the places academic system. Well, that I would say, let also, me add one more thing. We have more thing. Yes. Bohemian Grove is like one of the places people do this, right? It really sucks to be a certain kind of person who, and you know, who gets invited to Bohemian Grove because your life actually is kind of odd and a bit dull. Uh, so you go, and actually, it's a little bit. It's like you know Oxford, but drinking and you know, well, no wait, women. Wait, you right? you went to Bohemian Grove? No, 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 no. But um, <laughs> actually, that's... actually, I'm looking at the book right now, Bohemian Grove: Cult of Conspiracy by Mike Hansen, and they got pictures where him and Alex Jones went into um... when it's all the owl, the whole thing. But I think yeah. that's, I mean, it's so you know, even it's it's sort of a joke, right? Like or Davos, right? You know, life is really boring if you're trading all the time. So yeah. a lot of these places are kind of entertainment zones where people come together and have talks. So just as you guys, not you, but people develop conspiracies about Bohemian Grove, people develop conspiracies about subreddits, which yeah. from the inside, it sounds like you guys are participants, from the inside, you're like, really? No, right? That's not true. Um, but you might say maybe conspiracy theories attached to these places of let's call them cognitive freedom, but that cognitive freedom requires privacy. So there's something compelling for those stories. But I keep interrupting them, so so please. Uh, but no, but yeah. this is very close to what we're talking about here, uh, as far as how well, do maybe we chaos get rid of crime a lot and of... then hopeful abandonment. Yes. Oh yes. Yes. Well. But, but just re real quick. about information. Um, yes. Re real arming quick, though, I... people with a Bukhara market of arsenals of ideas. So. <laughs> <laughs> just re real quick though, I just wanted to quickly say that. Uh, the reason why I even bring this up to begin with is because I think there's a lot of pressure being built up and things like QAnon result from these questions not actually being addressed in, I wouldn't say shout it to the whole world, but at least have certain things that end up building in society to at least acknowledge like, yeah, some rich people meet up and they gather and look at this funny owl and yeah, there's some occult Whatever stuff is, here. Yeah. yeah, let's learn about on CNN, let's learn about sacred geometry. You know, let's actually have some people experts in symbolism <laughs> on come CNN? in and talk about this stuff yeah no 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 I'm, this is I'm, this, I'm, is, I'm this is part of the appeal of jordan peterson right peterson yeah. was somebody who and i think his most compelling stuff was this sort of early quasi jungian period um where um you know he's he's doing this kind of esoteric talking and somehow made it mainstream and he's like talking to eric trump on youtube so there there, there is a demand for that absolutely, absolutely. Love. yeah 
And I think they see a lot of resentment from the people who are in the inner circle or whatever, where they thumb their nose up at anybody who even talks about this stuff, even though to them it's like, of course you know about what's going on here. As someone, and if as, it's not as someone addressed, who devoted, just, you know, as someone who devoted a huge part of my life before Jordan Peterson to studying Carl Jung, I think he did a fundamental disservice by turning into a <laughs> self-help bracket, but that's another. Well, yeah, no, yeah, I mean, that's a, <laughs> it's an interesting story about Peterson remakes himself as a self-help guru and even worse as a kind of power and status guru. So mm. it's, you know, mm. it's gospel of wealth via uh, the lobster. <laughs> um, we, we keep interrupting uh, chaos. Hey, so, chaos, yeah, chaos, chaos, rhyme. Probably, Go for it, buddy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I wanted to try and uh, relate this back to uh, Zero's question there. Um, mm -hmm. but like we, we were talking a bit about like, you know, the, these, you know, private, uh, epistemic free spaces, you know, temporary autonomous zones and whatnot, where, yes, uh, that good. are, that are full of, nice. of, nice. uh, uh, you know, people hawking their, their ideological tidbits and so on, like basically like pl playing the role, you know, maybe of, of, you know, cognitive arms dealers. Um, but what they're, what they're vending are, you know, basically, you know, cult recruitment tools. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're not, they're not giving you, you know, I don't know, civilization is discontents. They're giving you Dianetics. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> right. Right. Subscribe I think that's a... to the other layer. Of, oh, by the way, subscribe to Patreon, subscribe to the Breakthrough Rules Patreon right now.